So first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone for being here. Uh, the CFC has the pleasure to organize the presentation of this special issue about generations and social change in the Sinophone world, guest edited by uh, Justine Rochot. So the French Center for Research on Contemporary China was established in 1991, and the center is based uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, it has a branch office uh, in Taipei since 1994. Uh, and the center also publish, uh, or the center, it is a public research institute uh, with a mission to study the political, economic, social, and cultural developments in Greater China. And uh, it also publishes a scientific journal uh, in English and French, uh, China Perspectives, uh, Perspective Chinoise, in which uh, the issue that is presented today uh, was published in March, uh, uh, in last March. So, uh, by the way, uh, I invite everyone to go to our website to, to check all the articles about uh, China perspectives and perspective chinoise in French. And uh, again, thank you very much uh, to being here. And I will give the floor uh, directly to, uh, to the next uh, speaker, maybe uh, Justine, no? Um, yeah, ju just want to say that the CFC Taipei is uh, really glad uh, to be able to organize this uh, presentation of uh, China Perspective last issue on generations and social change, uh, guest edited by Justin Rocho, uh, who is here today with us, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Institute of Sociology at Academia Sinica. And we are very glad to have with us uh, Huang Shuli, the chair of this uh, session uh, from uh, the Institute of Ethnology at Academia Sinica. So uh, I really want to, to thank Huang Shuli for coming here. And I will give the floor back to uh, Justine Rocho. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. And uh, thank you, Nathanael, for this uh, kind introduction. So I'm very proud uh, to get to present this special issue of China Perspectives uh, on generation that I've had the chance to uh, guest edit, especially with all the contributors present uh, here and online. Um, so first, I would like to thank again all the CFC uh, China Perspectives uh, crew uh, for following up closely on all the successive steps of, of, of the articles and who made uh, this uh, event possible today um, and, and to Hong Shuli for coming here to discuss uh, this, uh, this, uh, this talk. So as I said, we're all very happy that all the contributors could be here today. Uh, so we have uh, Sun Tia Wen, who will speak first, who's a doctor uh, in sociology from the EHESS and currently a postdoc at uh, EFEO. Uh, Hong Tao, who's a PhD candidate at the EHESS. EHESS. Uh, Mao Ting Yu, who's a doctor in sociology from the University of Edinburgh and currently a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Bielefeld University in Germany. And uh, Tanguy Le Pesan, uh, an associate professor at the National Central University in uh, Taiwan and also associate researcher to the CEFC. So uh, before we each engage in a short uh, presentation of our own articles, I would just like to say maybe just a few words uh, to provide you with some context as to uh, what led me to initiate uh, this uh, special issue on generations uh, for China perspectives. So um, basically, I am myself a sociologist of aging. So in 2019, I defended a, a PhD on retirees gatherings uh, and spaces of sociability in urban China, which actually led me to spend quite a lot of time uh, conducting ethnographic research among people who were mostly born between the late 40s and early 60s, uh, who were all recently retired, who grew up in the early years of the Maoist era, and who constituted the first uh, cohorts of one-child parents. So, among the things that sort of struck me in the course of my research was um, this very strong and constantly reaffirmed generational identity of these individuals who kept using uh, various expressions to designate themselves uh, collectively, such as uh, the past 50s, Wu Ling Ho, uh, the past 50s and 60s, Wu Liu Ling Ho, uh, the lost generation, Shi Luo De Yidai, 
the generation who most suffered, uh, the generation of one child parents, uh, or even the loneliest generation of parents in Chinese history. Uh, and so all these labels uh, were actually mobilized sometimes by the same persons, but, um, but kind of changed according to who they were addressing, uh, addressing and in which context. So having observed that, um, two elements led me to try and think further about issues of generational identities in China, but also uh, a, a bit later in other parts of what some may call the Sinophone world. So first, um, the, the even though the, the generation that I've studied has been researched uh, quite a lot, uh, existing studies tend to suffer from various limitations, and I think they are very close to the one that Tanguy Le Pezon, uh, addresses in his own paper for Taiwan, um, which is the fact that um, uh, existing research uh, mostly tend to concentrate on analyzing the youth experiences and traumas of this generation, and to define generations uh, solely, solely based on individuals' probability to have experienced these useful events, such as being a red guard, being sent down, etc. And the second limitation would be that a lot of these studies remain very cohort-based and quantitative, meaning that they mostly focus on defining generation very strictly based on specific dates. And, um, and, and so they deal, they pay a great attention uh, to the specific age brackets within uh, which one should be born to be considered uh, as belonging to a specific generation. And finally, the, the third limitation would be that researchers tend to designate these cohorts uh, using uh, generational labels that do not fit, do not correspond to the one that, uh, that people actually use to designate themselves. So these labels are mo most often imposed uh, than really stemming from fieldwork itself. And so as a whole, what uh, seemed lacking in this research was bo both a more qualitative, uh, dynamic, configurational, uh, grounded approach of generation, or in other words, uh, uh, approaches that would not be strictly based on predefined demographic cohorts, uh, used for the purpose of statistical analysis, but would rather pay attention um, to the ways that um, and context where people mobilize these generational categories to define themselves, uh, whatever their age may be. And uh, secondly, um, approaches that would focus on the historical and social context in which uh, specific generations uh, and generational labels are created. Uh, as well as the way that these labels uh, circulate and are appropriated by individuals in specific context and interactions and moments of their life course. And finally, uh, approaches that would consider generational identities and their formation in a more dynamic manner, paying attention to the, the processes of formation of generational identities and labels, and sometimes also to the um, sometimes un unexpected effects that they might have uh, in terms of uh, collective identities, collective actions, etc. So in other words, uh, the approach that I came to favor uh, would be to say that generations only exist scientifically as far as people use generational categories and labels to designate themselves or others as a way of uh, typifying, of categorizing the world around them, uh, to make sense from it and to act out of it. Um, so as far as people designate themselves or other by saying our generation, their generation, then it is worth studying as such. Hence uh, the, the title of my editorial, who, uh, which is called uh, Our Generation. So coming from this specific background and having uh, more recently spent a, a bit of time in uh, Hong Kong and then in Taiwan, I realized more generally that uh, beyond the Chinese retirees that were born in the 1950s that interested me in particular, um, generational labels actually seem to have uh, proliferated uh, in other parts of the Sinophone world as well, especially in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, and so you, you have labels such as uh, the post 80s, the last generation in China, which appeared just a few months before, um, the baby boomers, uh, the X generation or the cursed generation in Hong Kong, 
um, and the wild strawberry tribe, the fifth graders in, in Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera, to only name uh, just a few. So moreover, uh, despite this very, uh, despite some very punctual uh, enlightening research uh, existing, um, existing studies on generation in Hong Kong and Taiwan actually suffered, as I said, from the, the same sorts of limitations than in China with a very strong focus put on statistical analysis and with a very spread use of uh, generational labels and thresholds that didn't really necessarily match with the categories and labels that are employed locally by people. And so what I kind of intended to do when making this call uh, was to try and attract contributions that would confront these uh, generational labelings and identities based on a much more grounded approach that focus focuses, as I said, on, on processes that lead individuals and groups to develop uh, generational consciousness uh, on the history of those labels, uh, as well as the, on the, the forms that they, they, they may give way to, uh, such as collective actions. Uh, and, and, and kind of so to go beyond the usual uh, national borders that are uh, usually applied to research that um, makes people who only study China just focus on China. And so we can see that some of these labels sometimes are actually circulate and that generational identities are also uh, stemming from the, the, the relation, the national relationships uh, between uh, countries such as uh, the Taiwanese youth uh, with the face of Taiwan, uh, of uh, China. Uh, that kind of participates in shaping the collective consciousness of young Taiwanese people. So I won't develop much more, but uh, let me just finish by saying that uh, this type of approach that kind of focus on uh, the way that people talk and do generation, uh, on the way that people make sense of their collective present uh, and past experiences, uh, this kind of approach have actually developed in Western countries in the past uh, 15 or 20 years also, but are still largely lacking beyond Western case studies and in East Asian studies in particular. So I, I, I do hope that this special issue uh, can contribute to start filling this research gap and might provide also some ideas for further research to be engaged. And so I, I would like to thank again all the contributors uh, who provided with very insightful papers, which I think uh, kind of start filling this uh, research gap and that I really took a, a great joy in, uh, in discovering. So uh, without further ado, <laughs> I will now maybe give the floor to Sun Tiawen, uh, if you're here, Tiawen, um, to present her article on the Youth Without Regrets label in China, Qingchun Wu Hui. And so, yes, thank you, Tiawen. Hello. So I'm going to start it. Hello, everyone. I feel very honored to be part of this event today to promote the English version of this generation special issue. I will start by introducing myself. My name is Sun Jiawen and like Christina, I'm a PhD in sociology from the Center for Modern and Contemporary Chinese Studies of the School for Advanced Studies in Social Science. My dissertation supervisor was Professor Bonong, a renowned expert in educated youth studies. My PhD thesis was on the uh, sociology of suffering among the educated youth in uh, educated youth generation in China. And the suffering here includes uh, physical trauma, psychological trauma, collective trauma, and historical trauma, and so on. All kinds of uh, human suffering per se. The article I published on China Perspectives is actually based on part of my PhD thesis and is an in-depth study that builds on the original research. The article entitled Deconstructing Use Without Regret, State Power, Collective Memory, and the Formation of a Popular Narrative on the Educated Youth Generation revolves around the interpretation of the slogan Use Without Regrets, Qingchun Wu Hui. Here, use without regrets can be interpreted as I have no regrets about my use, or I have no regrets about what I did during my use. However, in either case, the slogan seems to be a little confusing. So let me start from the very beginning. 
I believe most of you today have heard of the uh, up to the mountain and down to the countryside movement, the 上山下乡运动, and the educated youth, uh, after all, uh, Justin and Tao also refer respectively to educated youth generation in their articles in this issue. Today, I'm not going to give a comprehensive account of the entire history of the down to the countryside movement, but rather provide some basic background information. From 1953 onwards, in order to ease the pressure of uh, employment in the cities, some urban youth began voluntarily or involuntarily to settle down and start a new life in the countryside. These urban youth are the pioneers of the educated youth. Although the title of educated youth was only proposed in 1964, young urban residents who went to the countryside before that were also usually regarded as educated youth. In 1955, Mao Zedong put forward an important instruction. The countryside is a vast world where much can be accomplished. Uh, this instruction later evolved into a better known and more succinct version. Much can be accomplished in the vast world. This slogan, as most of most other slogans, is easy to understand and highly provocative. However, when you think about it, the claim expressed in the sentence is indeed quite questionable. Firstly, in rural China at the time, was the world really so vast that it had the capacity to accommodate so many new populations? Secondly, can these urban youth, who know nothing about agricultural production, really accomplish so much in the countryside? The answer to these two questions seems obvious. Nevertheless, in the Mao East era, all practical difficulties had to give way to political ends. It can be said that all the difficulties, pain, and trauma suffered by the educated youth generation in the countryside are rooted in these two fundamental issues. By the time of the Cultural Revolution, and more specifically in the second half of the 1968, Mao had used the movement of Red Guards, uh, to achieve his political goal, to have Liu Shaoqi removed from power. One of the consequences of the political chaos created by the Red Guards was that by this time, the order of Chinese society has also been almost completely disrupted. It was necessary to prevent the situation from getting worse and tame the crazy Red Guards, so Mao Zedong sent them out to the countryside. Thereafter, down to the countryside movement lasted until its end in 1980. If counted from 1953, a total of 20 million educated youth in China have been sent to the countryside. There are many complex reasons for the end of the down to the down to the countryside movement, but one of the uh, important driving factors was the Great Return to the City campaign, Da Fancheng Yundong, launched by the educated youth of Yunnan province from late 1978 to early 1979. Most of these educated youth were from Chengdu and Chongqing and have been living in rural Yunnan for eight years by then. These eight years were by no means a happy one, as life in the countryside was indeed full of difficulties. As a result, they launched various resistance movements, including strikes, hunger strikes, petitions in Beijing, and sit-in at Tiananmen Square. This is a picture at the time. In order to demand the, that the central government allow them to return their cities of origin, eventually Deng Xiaoping agreed to their request. This is why these educated youth often said that it was their rebellion that put an end to the down to the countries at the moment. Now, if you think about it, these educated youth are perhaps the ones who resent the down to the countryside movement the most. If I tell you that it was precisely these people who firstly proposed youth without regrets for the educated youth generation, you will certainly find it very strange. I mean, how can, how can such a youth full of uh, traumatic experiences and painful memories be without regrets? So I finally back to my article about this issue. In this paper, I firstly traced the origin of this slogan and then clarified the various misunderstandings about it. In addition, I analyzed the reason for which these misinterpretations arose and the political effect of the uh, popularity of such a slogan on, on the Chinese society at the time. As I mentioned, this article is uh, from part of my PhD thesis and is, actu is actually uh, based on semi-structured interviews I conducted with uh, 60 educated youth during my doctorate. 
These interviewees include, included those former educated youth from Yunnan production and the construction course who initiated the resistance resistance movement to return to the city in the late 1970s and who firstly associated the slogan of youth without regress with the educated youth generation in early 1990s. I also interviewed some educated youth from Heilongjiang production and the construction course and compared the two groups. In fact, many people believe that the slogan youth without regress was firstly proposed by the educated youth of Heilongjiang or by the famous writer Liang Xiaosheng, also a former educated youth of Heilongjiang production and the construction course. In my article, I analyze why people misidentify the originator of this slogan. As the title of this article suggests, in this research, I also review what the sick power did to the collective memory of the educated youth in the process of youth without regrets becoming a dominant slogan in the mainstream narrative about this generation. I found the shaping of the popular narrative by the state power in this process to be quite subtle and efficient. In contrast to the various political slogans imposed during the Mao era, it has to be said that the renewal in the means of ideo ideological governance. In the end, I also examined the social context in which youth without regrets quickly became popular among the educated youth community and even became a cultural phenomenon in 1990s. Uh, we all know what happened in China in 1989. After the uh, Tiananmen Square incident, the Chinese government made an ideological shift toward uh, conservatism. And the educated youth took the opportunity to raise several nostalgic slogans, including youth without regrets. It can be said that, on the one hand, those educated youth who put forward the slogan youth without regrets, they did not necessarily believe that they had no regrets for their youth, nor that they did not regret going to the countryside. On the other hand, the popularity of youth without regrets actually reflects a kind of a complicity between the state power and the educated youth. This generation of educated youth who experienced not only various brutal political movements in the Mao era, but also Deng Xiaoping's drastic economic reforms are actually very sensitive to the political trends in contemporary China. They're also very good at taking advantage of opportunities and compromising appropriately. Just as an educated youth that I interviewed said to me, if I cannot just tell the truth, then it is also good to have two, two truths out of 10 sentences. Therefore, I think the significance of my uh, sociological analysis of the emergence and the popularity of this slogan, Youth Without Regrets, is that it, it allows us to see the very subtle confrontation and the cooperation between the state power and the popular narrative, revealing the more vivid personal emotions hidden under the grand narrative and helps us to further understand the complex logic of the political discourse in contemporary China. Thank you. Just in case anyone who doesn't know where Yunnan and Heilongjiang is, this is province uh, Heilongjiang and the Yunnan province is here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xiaowen. <laughs> And uh, I think we'll, maybe we can uh, turn the floor to Hong Tao for the second paper. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Let, let me just share my screen. OK. Okay, so uh, hi, um, I'm Tao and Hong Tao. Uh, I'm a doctoral student in sociology at the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, uh, which is also where Jiawen and, and Justina graduated from. Um, so let me first express my gratitude toward Ju uh, Justine for inviting me to submit a, an, an article for this special issue and toward the members of uh, Chinese Perspectives for their editorial and logistic support. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Jiawen for a most helpful introduction as my paper relates the life story of two retired Zhiqing and their trans transformation into important mother figures in the Chinese Tongzhi or uh, LGBT community. So uh, for my presentation, as we can uh, possibly go over the arguments I made in the uh, article, 
I'd like to uh, briefly explain the core uh, concerns of the study presented as two protagonists and outline before discussing um, how my paper fits in the collection uh, more specifically on the different dimensions um, uh, of, uh, 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 in which the analytical category of generation is relevant. So uh, the study uh, was carried out uh, within the framework of my PhD research, uh, which is an inquiry into the history of LGBT activism in China. Um, the central question I ask is how one become activist in an authoritarian setting. In other words, in which social spaces and under what circumstances do actions emerge? To that end, I employ a biographical approach inspired by interactionist sociology. The principles of this uh, activist Korea approach uh, was first clearly articulated in uh, Olivier Ciol's 2001 article in which the author attempts to remediate ra 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 mm, uh, what he consi considered to be a failure of main state social movement studies. Indeed, many uh, social movement studies focus on the actions and strategies of social movement organizations or SMO to the detriment of understanding concerns and uh, motivations of those involved in them. By contrast, Fiol advocated for a processual analysis of individual commitment by linking actions to individual life uh, history so as to understand what moved uh, individuals to act. Uh, I would argue that such a method is particularly well suited to the study of activism in contemporary China because the existence of SMO there can never be taken for granted, as many of you know. And the more groundings upon uh, which they operate are more than shaky. Um, so a lot of social and political actions can be considered as atomized actions as they were carried out by individuals without any organizational support. This is why uh, the internet played such an important role since the early 2000s uh, as, as um, two, uh, a few of the paper of this uh, issue uh, mentioned. Um, as it stood as a launching pad for individual actions and a platform for connecting uh, individuals. So uh, the starting point of my research is one of the most remarkable features of LGBT activism in China. And by that, I refer to uh, the prominence of parents and especially mothers who uh, stood up for their sexually non-conforming children. Uh, so China is not unique in this regard. Um, as uh, in, in Taiwan, you have uh, similar figures, uh, Guo Mama, such as Guo Mama. In France, uh, we have Contact. Uh, Contact was actually also inspired by the same uh, US organization I mentioned in the paper, uh, PFLAG. Uh, so uh, parents, families, and friends of uh, lesbians and gays. Uh, which was founded by uh, Jean, uh, Jean uh, Manford in 1973. Uh, what distinguished the Chinese case is, the, uh, is perhaps the central position they occupied in the landscape of LGBT activism. So uh, the two protagonists of study are two women who were uh, at the origin of this activism. Both were retired Zhiqin. Uh, actually, they belong to the three old classes. Uh, that is the first batch of high school students who were sent to the countryside in 1968. So um, the prominence, uh, let me just share uh, two, a few few photos uh, that uh, which highlight the uh, uh, existence of this organization, uh, Qingyou Hui. Uh, uh, this is a performance uh, of uh, parents, of mothers, as you can see. Uh, this is their national uh, uh, imprint. And well, this was one of the events they organized a few years ago. And so the two protagonists of this uh, of this paper, uh, the first one's Mama Wu. Uh, as you can see, uh, she uh, published a book uh, in 2018. Uh, uh, and the book was actually edited by a Hong Kong editor specialized in Zhiqing publications. And, and she's quite well known. Uh, 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 because you can see on the uh, left upper uh, right corner, uh, this is the uh, article by uh, uh, Zero One uh, Hong Kong, which is uh, the biggest uh, Hong Kong online news platform. 
Uh, and uh, below, you can see her dancing in a park in Guangzhou. Uh, this is uh, this. She was dancing when I when I met her. Uh, she still does, uh, even uh, well now, yeah, to this day. The other protagonist is uh, it's uh, it's Ant Lotus. Uh, she also published a book, and this book uh, you see on the screen is actually published in Taiwan by uh, G Books uh, Taiwan. And um, and uh, and and you can also see uh, this is actually a picture that I found on Flickr. Uh, it's uh, for some a user named Hello Career. Uh, it's a picture of the 2013 of the uh, the uh, Tongzhi Parade in Taiwan. And below, you can see that this user said, "I am uh, parading with the blessings of uh, Oi, which is uh, Ant Lotus." Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, article itself is uh, divided into three sessions in roughly, in a roughly, uh, chronological order. It first considers their, uh, family background and the same down experience, and then, uh, end, ends, uh, with their first engagement with return to the, uh, activism, uh, before the founding of, um, organizations and linking these two uh periods are actually uh the uh the core of this process of their transformation and it happened on a blog is there were bloggers uh so uh i argue that uh it's it is precisely the reassessments of the situation past who are uh, transformed uh that who uh transformed them into uh, LGBT activist later. Um, here, the connection with uh, Jiao Wen's article becomes quite apparent uh, because uh, it is uh, precisely on um, the uh, questioning uh, of this uh, narrative of uh, youth without regret that OE uh, uh, start to re reflect more critically on, on uh, many uh, issues around her. And as for Wu, she um, uh, she actually started her transformation earlier, uh, and this is related to uh, their respective uh, family background. Oh, um, let me just skip this. Uh, so there are, as you can see, this a quick summary. There are, Wu was from an elite family background. Her father is, a, she was born into a high country, high level country family uh, with her father, uh, uh, on the eighth rank, according to the uh, official uh, ranking system. And uh, he was labeled a uh, rightist in 57. So the fam family suffered a lot of uh, political uh, setbacks. And then, uh, and she, uh, and of course he was uh, habilitated uh, at the end of the Mao period and become an official writer. Um, as for Lu, she uh, was born three years later and she was from a more modest family, but her father was also an intellectual figure, uh, not uh, because he uh, was a party cadre in a national daily, and he was probably targeted as well, well, during those uh, political campaigns of the Mao era. So uh, basically, uh, both were sent to, uh, sent down in 68, uh, Wu was sent to a village in northern Guangdong, and uh, Lu was sent to a farm in Beida Huang, Heilongjiang. Uh, and, and as you can see, those are not, uh, those two women are not from anywhere. They're actually from two of the most, uh, the biggest and most prominent cities. So uh, there's a structural element to their engagement. Um, but uh, as I argue, the process of their transformation is actually happened on this chance encounter with a new generation of, of Tongzhi youth uh, on, on, the, on their uh, block. And so uh, this article uh, is mostly, uh, well, used uh, the, the blog as uh, my primary source. Uh, and I would like to just uh, stress one point. It's uh, before the founding of LGBT organizations. So these are, atomized uh, into the uh, actions uh, 
rather than a collective action. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude the, my presentation with uh, three ways in which the, the label generation is mobilized in, in this uh, paper. The first one is a generation as defined by collective memory, which is also mentioned by uh, uh, Jia Wen. And here's a quote from uh, Shi Tie Shen uh, on his book, Now on Principles, which was cited by uh, Lu in, in, on her blog. Uh, basically, uh, it, we see this for, uh, formative experience of, of the Jixing uh, period on, on, their, on their life. And the second, uh, second um, way that the label, uh, the category of generation is relevant is in uh, the generation as a as an family generation in, inside a family. So we could see this from this quote uh, from Wu that uh, she actually cited uh, uh, the influence of her father, especially on her uh, uh, thoughts and, and values that she uh, hold on to. And those same values that was then, she said, uh, transmitted to her, her child, her, her son. And the th last way uh, which the generation is relevant is maybe in this, interaction between different social generations. So in this case specifically, uh, uh, Wu and Lu's activism actually um, pushed them to engage with a lot of youth of the generation of their son. So the here, the it's not just intergenerational dynamics as defined in a family setting, but uh, generations uh, in a society as uh, they, uh, um, this interaction actually uh, defined uh, the synergy of, of the parent generation and the children generation actually defined the activism that I'm trying to uh, uh, describe. And yeah, with that, I think uh, uh, that's that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. So, can you put my PPT on? <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, thanks a lot. And so, I will uh, go on with presenting my own article now, uh, which is entitled uh, Beijing Dama Have Something to Say uh, Group Identification and Online Collective Action Among Retirees in Contemporary China. So uh, this paper uh, actually constitutes a sort of a prolongation from my uh, PhD uh, and from the analysis of retiree spaces that I studied during my PhD um, by looking at a rather new phenomenon that, um, uh, that is the emergence of online spaces where Chinese retirees uh, slowly manage to express themselves collectively uh, in the name of their aging peers and in the name of their generation of uh, aging uh, one-child parents. So the online space, uh, which is at the core of my article, is called Beijing Dama or Beijing Aunties uh, have something to say. So Beijing Dama or Hua Shuo and was recommended to me by uh, several previous informants as early as 2016. So after following the platform for a while, I actually uh, slowly realized that it had go grown really extremely popular among the, the retirees that I knew across various Chinese cities with about, with about uh, 5 million followers in 2019, uh, which led me to pay greater attention to it. So, more concretely, uh, Beijing Dama is an online platform which is based on WeChat and which was created in December 2015 by a small uh, Beijing-based company and which is described on their homepage as, I quote, a home for you and for millions of, of other old companions where you can talk with people your age about what makes you happy, about the country's important events and about what's happening in your home. So um, the platform provides uh, roughly two kinds of services, uh, which mainly address and attract a public of uh, retired uh, urban women uh, born between the late 40s and early 60s. So first, you, uh, you have two hundreds of uh, short, uh, now hundreds of short videos. So I think now about 13 or 1400 videos. Uh, no, 13,000. 
a thousand and four hundred, yes, a thousand and three hundred or four hundred or so videos, um, where uh, volunteer retired women speak up in the name of their aging peers, uh, with each each video starting with the same uh, slogan, with the same sentence that says, "You don't have to be someone to have a say." Senior Citizens Day is not the only time to hear their voice, and uh, secondly. You you also have uh, online chat groups, um, group chats, sorry, that thousands of older citizens, which are scattered all around the country, can join to exchange on their uh, shared experiences of aging, uh, to meet up with other older people, uh, but also to provide show hosts with ideas of topics and uh, subjects to tackle in, in their videos. So uh, what mainly surprised me when I started paying attention to this online platform was that there were actually many opinions, uh, uncertainties, identities that I, that I had heard uh, formulated in a very scattered way uh, during my previous fieldwork among your young retirees, which uh, kind of suddenly seemed uh, to have found a space uh, to be expressed collectively in the name of one age group and one generation. And, and this space unprecedentedly connected the older people that I had been studying. So in other words, uh, what uh, Beijing Dama uh, seemed to reflect and that I address in my paper uh, is the emergence of new forms of collective identification and group consciousness among retirees in China, which uh, leads them to express themselves as a collective, as a group, uh, and to defend their shared points of view uh, on an online platform, uh, despite China's politically constraining environment for the, the expression of uh, collective interest. And so what my paper tries to do uh, through an analysis of about uh, 400 videos, which are mostly viewed more than 100,000 times, um, so what, what I try to do through this analysis of videos, group chat, as well as through uh, some interviews that I did with the core members of this group, is to try and understand the various uh, social processes uh, which, um, which can actually explain why these retired women came up to speak up as a we today. So processes among which uh, forms of generational consciousness constitute one aspect, but only one aspect among others. So my article is divided into uh, five parts uh, that each point out to a specific aspect that contributes to this, um, to the understanding um, of the strong collective identity expressed by these Chinese retirees. So the first aspect, uh, which I, tackle in my paper uh, and which is, is which is mentioned in a, a lot of it, these videos is the role played by the recent stigmatization of aging women uh, in Chinese society, especially through the popularization of the derogatory label uh, Dama or Auntie, uh, which has kind of emerged uh, to criticize new cohorts of aging women who were increasingly engaging uh, in collective pra practices which were perceived by many as uncivilized, embarrassing, et cetera, uh, such as uh, square dancing or uh, collective uh, massive investments in gold, for example, uh, to only name a few. And so what I show in this first part is that this uh, diffused stigma uh, actually played an important role in triggering group identification among Chinese aging women, even leading to a process of uh, stigma reversal that I think we'll find again in Tongi's article, uh, as illustrated uh, in the very name of the show, uh, where show hosts actually proudly revendicate their Dama identity, uh, despite the term having been largely uh, stigmatized. So the second aspect uh, of my presentation uh, focuses on the gener generational identity uh, formulated in many videos. So as I explain, um, what struck me here was that the generational labels that were mobilized online by these women, uh, especially the expression of uh, Wu Liu Ling Ho, so post 50s, 60s, uh, didn't really correspond to the, the, the thresholds, the category usually mobilized by social scientists who kind of, as I said, uh, tend to define generation based on specific youth experiences and therefore tend to limit the definition of this generation uh, to uh, solely 
the people born in the 50s, and so tend to neglect the people who were born in the early uh, and mid 60s. And um, indeed, what um, uh, the, these women do not really define themselves uh, as a generation because of a specific shared use experiences, because most of them, they were not all being jutting, they were not all uh, red, past red guards or whatever, but they define themselves as belonging to a generation more largely because they consider themselves as all having been repeatedly targeted as cohorts and mostly as women also um, by state policies all along their life course. Uh, so may it be uh, through their youth under the Mao era, uh, but also in their marital years where the one child policy struck, uh, in their middle age when a lot of women were laid off during the privatization of public enterprises, uh, and most importantly now as retired aging parents of only ch children who are all uh, uncertain as to what the future holds for them, uh, as illustrated by a video where um, a show host describes them as the first generation to only have themselves to count on in old age. So a third aspect uh, that I treat in the article is uh, focuses on the role uh, played by their current experiences of intergenerational relationships. Um, with multiple videos which deal with the, the numerous burden that these women uh, face in their old age in the context of uh, property inflation and also limited state support for childcare. So I think there will there is a nice echo also with uh, the, the Martin Yu presentation uh, on grandparenting. And so um, as such, the Dama often address their children generation in their videos, uh, especially explicitly um, asking them to better try and understand their parents' perspective, especially when it comes to asking their parents to take care um, of their infants as if it were a, na a natural duty, but also when it comes to asking their parents to help contribute in buying an apartment uh, and these kind of things. So in the fourth part, uh, I focus more specifically on the role uh, played by the larger emergence of what I call uh, uh, a third age of life, un troisième age, uh, in China, which participates in the rise of uh, new social values, which associate retirement with uh, a second spring of life, uh, deserving to be enjoyed uh, plentifully. So I won't go into details, but uh, the idea here was to pinpoint the fact that both uh, state policies, but also private businesses have largely participated in the past 20, 30 years in the creation of this new uh, age category in China, which is locally described as the Zhong Lao Nian Ren uh, or middle elderly. But I think like, for example, in in Taiwan, we could think also of a chu lao or shouling, uh, this kind of words that kind of describe intermediary categories between adulthood and the oldest old, which are fairly new as expressions. And, um, and so the, the diffusion of these new expressions um, uh, have further enhanced the group identification of these uh, middle elderly women represented in the show. And so the last part of my paper finally concentrates on the multiple videos in which show hosts express themselves as defenders of elderly's interests. Um, so here I point out the fact that Beijing Dama actually play a, a role which is similar to the one of an interest group um, whose existence is inseparable from two elements. So the first element is the increase of public policies which target old age and mostly uh, urban old age, such as through pension, for example, and which participate in the creation of new categories of interest, uh, which enhance the fact that people defend their collective interest. And secondly, you also have the development of online and offline uh, spaces for the elderly, which enhance the connection between them, between them and help them develop a, a collective consciousness of their shared uh, condition. So at the end, uh, in the conclusion, uh, I offer some perspectives on the recent developments of Beijing Dama, 
um, especially by pointing out uh, its uh, increased co-optation by the state and its increased uh, depoliticization, which kind of allows me to question the, the perennity of such group um, for the, ex the expression of collective interest in the Chinese current political environment. So as a whole, but I think we'll be able to discuss this in the in the discussion. So I think we can find some echo with multiple uh, other articles, uh, especially with um, uh, factors uh, such as um, the, the role of, of the Internet, uh, the, the role of the collective stigma imposed by other, but also uh, the aging experiences of post-war uh, cohorts in different parts of the of the Sinophone world. So, yeah. I think I will stop here and let uh, Tingyu take the floor to tell us further about issues of grandparenting that I just evoked. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Justin. I'll try to share my screen. So, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here to join the promotion of this special issue. I really thank Justin for being a very supportive guest editor, and also thank the editorial team for their support. Um, so this is an article I co-wrote with um, my colleague Lin Qing. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here. Uh, this is actually an article based on her PhD thesis. So I feel a bit weird speaking for her on her PhD project, but I'll try my best. Uh, and if I get any questions I can't answer, I'll uh, try, uh, make sure the answer reach her and get back to you. Um, so I, when I search, I try to find a picture about grandparenting online, I noticed that many, all of the picture I see um, portray this to portray grandparenting as a very joyful thing that both uh, elderly people and children are smiling very happily in the photo. But actually through, through our research, we find it's not necessarily the case. Uh, but on the other hand, grandparenting is really prevalent in China. Uh, so the available data we have is that uh, around 60 to 70% of um, of in China, uh, people hand their child to their their parents for grandparenting, and uh, almost about thirty percent, the whole care, child care is shouldered by grandparents themselves alone. Uh, so it's a really prevalent phenomenon. Uh, and how it relates to the idea of generation is we think grandparenting is a really interesting and important site to understand this kind of intergenerational negotiation and how that reflects the change uh, of uh, the social change. This, uh, this is actually the, um, not grandparenting, but this kind of international uh, intergenerational negotiation is actually a focus of Lin Qing's PhD thesis. And uh, for her project, she, uh, she did field work from 2015 to 2016, and she did 120 interviews with uh, among these 30 only child families. So she's she wants to explore how the generation of uh, only child generation uh, and during her research are young couples and uh, starting to enter the stage of marriage and child rearing and how they need um, ne negotiate um, relationships with their parents which is also the parents of the only child uh, generation. So, um, so their parents are mostly born in the 1950s to 1960s, and the young couples are uh, mostly born in 1980s. And the uh, focus is on urban Tianjin. So um, it's safe to say that the group she's looking at is quite privileged in the sense that they are mostly middle class and quite well, well off in, in terms of socioeconomic stances and based in urban area. And she also did some participant observation to observe the dynamic of this kind of intergenerational negotiation. So in this presentation, I just um, I wouldn't go into details of what's covered in the article because my hope is that people will read the article eventually. But I would like to highlight three points that we're trying to send through this article. Um, so the first point is that we try to bring a bi 
generational perspective to understand grandparenting, which is quite lacking in the existing literature about grandparenting, because most of them just focus on perspectives from one generation, either the parents' generation or the grandparents' generation. But, but um, in this research, by bringing these two generations together, we get to see how their views are so different, how they experience the same thing in drastically different ways. And it also allows us to gain a fuller understanding of how grandparenting is negotiated between these two generations, and also the many discrepancies and incons inconsistencies between their perspectives. And we don't prioritize the perspective from one particular generation. Instead, we try to give equal weight to both adult couples and their parents' views. And also, we try to argue that sometimes they hold very different views in, in relation to grandparenting. Also because their uh, views are largely shaped by their different general uh, generational experiences in relation to specific social and cultural contexts. So it is also the sense that how, because we're talking about generation in two senses, one sense is uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, family, so it's familiar, uh, family generation, as Xiaoben has mentioned, uh, but on the other sense is the social generation. And so the second um, point we want to explore in this article is how these two senses intersect, intertwine, and to shape the whole grandparenting experience and to shape the intergenerational negotiation. So we did observe that because of their different generational experiences. They do have different understanding of different and also different expectations towards childcare. Uh, for example, as you can see from this quote, it's from a grandma and she's talking most uh, almost nostalgically that, uh, so now I spend almost all time on my second granddaughter. Unlike in the past, there's no nursery school at the workplace anymore and people ca cannot take their children to the office anymore. So she's kind of nostalgically reflect on her own experience of child care uh, back to um, when she was working and uh, reflect on how uh, things has changed quite dramatically. And so now uh, she, because the lack of public childcare facilities, she became the one to shoulder a, a large burden of childcare. And um, also, also another um, example of how a different generational experience leads to different expectations of childcare. It's about the idea of in intensive parenting, which is a quite newly emerged phenomenon in China among the uh, relatively young couples. So they have more expectations about what, what child care should in, incorporate. So they also expect their their parents to um to do more uh to do parenting a certain way that could be labeled as intensive parenting. But that's mostly not their parents' experience because uh there's another quote by by a guy who said, Oh, when I was young, my father just sent me to the rural area to live with my grandparents. He's a very hands-off parents so uh, this is quite common back to the, that time because people don't do very intensive parents people are quite chill about parenting so I think these two are very interesting examples to see um, how people's uh, experience of child care it also reflects their own generational experience um, based on certain social and political context. Um, so in the later um, half of the quote, the, the grandma continued to say, okay, so we have this kind of conflicts and uh, I think it's unfair. A lot of childcare work is uh, on me now, but still she said, the less trouble, the better. If I talk to the couple, they will consider it as complaining and I will count on my only son in the future. After all, we did not offer much help with the first child and I do, do not want my daughter-in-law's family to find fault with us in terms of childcare. So, at the moment, she'll just do whatever she's asked to do now. So I think this also relate to how Justin uh, talk about the uncertainty of this generation of only child's parents in terms of their old aged life, uh, that 
they they are not sure how they are they will be cared of in the future, and also they are aware there's a quite limited public. Uh, resource for the aid, old age care, and most likely they are likely to rely on their children in the future. So uh, that relates to the third point that we we did observe that both these two generations they show different degrees of individualization. So they they talk about their uh, experience, expectations, understandings mostly from their own perspectives and according to their own individual needs, rather than prioritizing the family as a uh, entity. So this shows. Um, Mostly we argue we're quite aware that the younger generation are quite individualized. Um, but in this article, we also argue that parents' generation is also increasingly show this awareness of individual benefits and well-being. And they are also uh, on the path to individualization, um, but perhaps to a different degrees to their children. But on the one hand, we have this growing sense of individual interests and needs. On the other hand, they are still quite tied closely together, the two generations, because of this issue of codependency. Like I mentioned, the, the parents are very aware that in the future they may rely on their children for support. So at the moment, they need to do their part and to um, take care of the grandchildren. And also the, the children rely on their parents a lot because of the lack of public support in terms of childcare. So this kind of thing just, the, the current social context just binds the two generations together and the deepen the dependency of both generations, despite that they, they um, ideally all would like to have more individualized um, uh, needs and this despite this raising individualized uh, awareness. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to any questions and comments. Okay. The floor yourself. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, good afternoon and uh, good uh, morning to uh, everyone. First, I would like to thank uh, Justine, Nathaniel, and everyone for organizing this uh, little uh, event. Okay, it's better like that. Okay. Uh, so with uh, my paper, we will cross the Taiwan Strait and talk a little bit about uh, Taiwan and Taiwanese youth with a generational perspective. Uh, so when, uh, yeah, I have to, <laughs> like the drums. Uh, so when I first started to uh, think about uh, the paper I would write, um, I had two main goals in mind. The first one was uh, to conduct a theoretical discussion on the notion of generation and its use in the field of Taiwan studies. And the second one was how to apply the concept of generation to the study of Taiwanese use and political behavior. Um, Generally speaking, when uh, uh, we talk about uh, a generation, generations, uh, we have three main possible definitions. Um, the first one uh, is uh, the family generation. When we talk about family generations, uh, we talk about the position occupied by individuals in a family lineage. Um, these generations are linked by the life cycle of families and individuals. For example, when we talk about three or four generations under the same roof, grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, we talk about uh, family generation. But uh, there are two other uh, definitions uh, which uh, will be at the center of my paper. The first one is what we call a generational cohort or generational generation in itself. Whoops. Yeah, I have to Sorry. think about that. Thank you. Do you want to do it? I can help you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so the second generation, the second uh, definition is the generational cohort. Uh, we have a generational cohort when a birth cohort meet with, uh, meets with uh, major social or historical changes. And the magnitude of these changes triggers what we call a cohort effect. Uh, cohort effect is uh, the long 
long lasting effects of social change on a court mindset or worldview or attitudes. At that point, we have a, a large number of persons within the same generational court, uh, the same generational group that start to share the same values, life goals, need for change, etc. But they do not have uh, uh, the consciousness of uh, sharing these uh, views, sharing these goals, sharing these values. They do not have a shared uh, generational narrative to create bonds between uh, these individuals. So that's what we call a uh, generational cohort. And it changes with the actual generation. Here I use a uh, term uh, from uh, Karl Mannheim's work. And the actual generation is um, when a generational cohort uh, is uh, producing a generational narrative, a generational uh, consciousness, and uh, that creates a sense of belonging, that creates bonds between individuals uh, mm -hmm. within this, uh, this group. And this generation becomes a collective actor of uh, social change. So the core of my paper uh, is, was, <laughs> Uh, to show how a uh, young generational cohort emerged in the 2000s and then transformed into an actual generation in the 2010s to become a collective actor of uh, social change. So in order to do that, uh, I worked on data from three sets of uh, interviews uh, I made. So the first, uh, the first uh, set um, is uh, made of 261 individual interviews conducting between uh, 2004 and 2020. The second set of data is made of 11 focus groups uh, constituted with four to six uh, people in each group and focused on, uh, on uh, one or two main topics. And uh, they were uh, organized between 2011 and 2019. And the third set of data is made of 17 longitudinal uh, interview series with uh, the first four persons followed since 2007. So that's it for the data. And um, in order to uh, assess the formation of a new generation, uh, I use three intersecting dimensions, uh, the identity-based dimension, the depths of citizen or civic awareness, and the political mobilization or active citizen uh, engagement. Um, so first of all, we have to talk a little bit about uh, the context in the 2000s. Um, the birth court born in the 80s, uh, uh, met the new socio-political configuration produced by the democratization. This new socio-political configuration can be synthesized or summed up to three or four uh, main points. The first one is uh, that the democratic institutions refocused uh, on uh, Taiwan and its population. The, the, the name of Taiwan, the official name of Taiwan remained Republic of China, but the, the institutions uh, refocused and centered on Taiwan and its population. The second uh, main point uh, is uh, that the education system centered on uh, nurturing young Taiwanese citizens with values, knowledge, and skills necessary for life in a democracy, in a Taiwanese uh, democracy. And the third point is a new uh, media environment with uh, the development of internet. And after 2007, 2008, mainly, um, the creation of alternative online media. Uh, that created a generational divide in the use of media and uh, the sources of information. I have no time to develop that, but uh, if you have a question, uh, I, I can develop later. Um, so these, uh, this transforming uh, social configuration had uh, impact effects on uh, the three dimensions I mentioned before. The first one is the identity-based dimension. Uh, it can be divided into three moments or three aspects, self-perception, naming by others, and uh, presentation, presentation to others. So in terms of self-perception, uh, when we talk with uh, this uh, generation uh, in the 2000s, uh, they have a widely shared sense of belonging to a uh, sovereign uh, Taiwanese nation. Uh, 
uh, they also feel that uh, the classic uh, divide between Bandira and Weishengren uh, is not uh, relevant anymore. Uh, the third point is, they, is that they are rejecting uh, the still quite powerful uh, hollow exclusive ethno nationalism in the 2000s. And uh, they also have a sense of weakness uh, due to an atomistic perception of themselves. They feel that uh, they cannot uh, create the conditions of a collective action, a collective political action uh, or social movement, such as those we will uh, see in the 2010s. Uh, so they feel uh, weak and they feel powerless uh, in front of a system. And for the younger ones, especially those who are still students, they even do not consider themselves as fully adults. This uh, sense of uh, weakness and this feeling of uh, being powerless is uh, uh, reinforced by uh, the narrative coming from outside, what we call uh, naming by others. Here, elders will develop a very negative narrative uh, stigmatizing uh, this uh, generation as privileged, emotionally fragile, spoiled by consumerism, and this uh, narrative uh, by others, by elders, is very powerful because these, the stereotypes are uh, relayed by conservative media. And at that time, in the 2000s, the young generation do not have the means to counter attack or to counter this uh, narrative. It will come later in the 2010s. So they do not have uh, a collective uh, generational narrative. They do not have a uh, generational uh, consciousness. Uh, this is uh, paralleled with uh, a weak citizen awareness. They have bad to very bad opinion of the two main political parties, uh, the KMT and the DPP. And they also uh, equal or assimilate uh, party politics to politics in general. So they have, very, they have generally uh, no interest in politics. They do not talk about politics uh, among, among uh, people of the same age. And they think that politics is boring, chaotic, full of conflicts and for uh, old, uh, old adults. Of course, this, uh, this has a consequence in terms of political mobilization with low participation in civil society and social movements. And even uh, the two main uh, student movements of the end of the 2000s, the Lotion uh, Leprosarium and the Wild Strawberries movements have no, uh, no real national uh, impact and no long lasting effects uh, in terms of, of, of generation creation or generation consciousness creation. And it's also uh, in terms of political mobilization, we also have a very low participation rate uh, in local and national elections with uh, participation being uh, 15 to 20 points under uh, the average uh, national turnout. I know that I will be uh, beyond the 10 limits, uh, 10 minute limits, sorry. You can compensate for the underrepresentation of Taiwan. Yes, this exactly, issue. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, the right to be 15 minutes late. <laughs> Taiwan wants me. <laughs> okay, uh, so oh, there is a little mistake, an actual generation for itself. So now we will uh, focus on the 2010s. And first, we, we talk a little bit about uh, the changing general context. So in the 2010s, we have um, many changes with first a growing sense of uh, crisis among uh, youth with uh, continuing living conditions uh, that are deteriorating, uh, environmental issues that are popping up, especially after uh, the Fukushima uh, uh, catastrophe and uh, and the, what we call the china factor which is the uh, the growing pressure uh, of china on the, the taiwan uh, democracy which the cssta is the cross trade service trade agreement uh, being pushed rushed uh, into the legislative reign by the um, the Kuomintang. 
and the subsequent uh, sunflower movement. So this is the first point, a uh, growing sense of crisis among youth. And the second point is the formation of an alternative space of uh, politicization, uh, both uh, in the streets with environmental and social issues, uh, social movements, and online with uh, alternative uh, online platforms, media that are uh, created by youth and for, for youth. Uh, for by young people and for young people. And um, third point is the multiplication of successful student movements. Uh, the anti guo guang movement, the anti-media monopoly, the sunflower, we can, we can deem them uh, successful. There is a, deb a debate about that, I know, but uh, most of, of young people think that, okay, they had some, some successful results. And um, in terms of the three dimensions I used uh, in my analysis, um, analysis um, the the identity based dimension uh, so uh, for the self perception self perception sorry uh, more and more young people more and more uh, people feel that they are on the right side of history as opposed to their elders that are uh, considered to bring Taiwan on the wrong path uh, the second uh, point is that they have a sense of empowerment. Uh, in the 2000s, they they, they felt uh, that the older the older of of the young of the young generation felt that they were powerless, and then and now uh, the uh, older and the younger of the young generation uh, think that they have a sense of empowerment due to the multiple successes of uh, student movements. Uh, generally speaking, they have a more positive, assertive, and combative self-perception. And uh, the naming by, by other, the narrative from, uh, from outside, is still very negative, but not that powerful anymore, because uh, the, the, the young generation can oppose uh, another uh, narrative, a collective and generational narrative that is spread through uh, alternative online media. And that can be uh, summed up uh, by two sentences. Uh, we must save ourselves and we must save Taiwan. The we must save ourselves part is uh, linked to a demand for uh, generational uh, justice, which means that they consider that uh, older people in Taiwan benefited from uh, economic development, but left the young generation with only problems. Uh, environmental issues, uh, the problem of um, buying an apartment because of skyrocketing uh, real estate prices, the problem of low salaries, the problem of uh, deteriorating uh, working conditions, and so on. And the We Must Save Taiwan is linked uh, to uh, um, the, the feeling of uh, having to fight against uh, pro-China and authoritarian elder forces incarnated by uh, politicians like uh, Ma Ying-chiu, Hong Xiu-zhu, or uh, Han Guo. When we uh, go uh, to, to talk about uh, citizen awareness and political mobilization, we can divide this period of the 2010s into two smaller period, periods. The first one is more about uh, the beginning of the 2010s, and the second one is about the end of the 2010s. So in the beginning of the 2010s, um, we uh, continue to have a sense of crisis for Taiwan's future, but also uh, a growing interest for political issues through alternative online media. A lot, uh, more, uh, a lot uh, of young people start to get interesting in politics. and. Um, a lot through uh, online media uh, platform that are created by other uh, young people. And uh, of course, there is also a growing participation in many, many uh, small and big uh, social movements. But what is interesting is that this uh, um, citizen awareness and political mobilization in the streets or even online do not translate into uh, uh, the polls. There is still a low participation rate in local and national elections with still 15 to 20 points under the national average uh, turnout. This changes in the second, almost finished, almost finished. This uh, changes in the second part of the 2010s 
with the extension of uh, political sphere that I called uh, by the by the youth and for the youth because it's created by uh, young people uh, and for other young people to uh, to create uh, a dynamic of interest for uh, politics. So, for example, with unlike political talk, political talk shows like the Boang Ye Show or young influencers like Froggy. Chiu Weiqie or Olga Chen, uh, Chen Zihan, or young political candidates like uh, Huang Qie, and etc. I, 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 go, I go faster. Um, so this is the first point. And the second point is a growing sense of a generational confrontation, especially in the wake of the 2018 referendums on gender equality and, and same-sex marriage and the Hong Kong uprising against China's Extradition law. Uh, at that point, uh, I think 2018 is a very important year because a lot of, of uh, young people realize that their parents and uh, the, 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 the people with the same age as their parents are very, very conservative. They knew it, but they suddenly it's plash into, the, into their heads and they want to fight it and they want to fight it openly before they were silent and now uh, they, they they want to fight fight it much more directly and this i think can uh, be a part of the explanation of a stronger electoral participation uh, first in the 2020 national elections and then uh, during the recall vote against uh, Han Guoyu and uh, the saving of uh, Kaohsiung councillor uh, Huang Tie. Conclusion. Uh, so very fast as a conclusion, I, I think um, we saw that generational identification has transcended uh, during uh, the past decade and uh, that we have now um, an actual generation, a generation for itself that defends uh, uh, its value for, for the Taiwanese society and defends its own uh, interests. And with the persistent absence of right-left political divide in Taiwan and the weakening of the structuring influence of ethnic identifications, uh, generations as collective identities might continue to play an important role in shaping uh, the future of Taiwan. So I think we should do more research uh, in a generational perspective uh, on Taiwan. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for being late. Thank you very much. So uh, just I need to just go near the mic and we can um, maybe so we'll give the floor to uh, Hong Shuli to do a, a discussion of our papers and hopefully we can find time to engage with your questions and with the project. Yeah, I hope so. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to join the event and um, I'm pretty sure to be chaired the, uh, the discussions. Uh, but I'm extremely anxious because of the English. I don't have many chance to speak English uh, during the last few years. So last night I asked my son, should I use English or Chinese? And I feel nervous. And my son said, you should use Chinese, the one you feel comfortable. <laughs> so now I will change to Chinese. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so um, 首先我非常恭喜主编还有几位作者完成了这个非常有趣的 spatial issue 清楚的呈现世代观点和对当代中国研究的重要性那这五篇文章尽管各有各的关怀方法论也不太一样前提却颇一致都是将世代视为一种具有共享身份识别 I use the word 共享身份识别,身份识别 as the identifications, yeah. And the uh, uh, identity I translated to Chinese身份认同, uh, in order in, to, to <coughs> so, 具有共享身份识别的集体身份认同, 那当人们意识到彼此是一代人的时候，他也会意识到这一代人所共享的身份识别是什么。那在各自的文章当中，几位作者通过所关注的现象，动用不同的方法论，从不同的角度剖析世代身份认同、身份识别。
、世代意识乃至于世代身份认同的塑造，借以呈现世代和当代中国与台湾社会的相互构成。那在我看完这几篇文章以后，我对世代的认识和对世代研究的看法也有所改观。总结来看，我看到了一个现象学取径的世代研究似乎正在成型。那几位作者已经不再纠结在世代的人口学基础和科学科学科学客观性的辩论，而是以世代现象和世代经验作为探讨世代真实性。I mean the actuality of the generations, and 或者是真实世代 actual generations 的实证基础。那现象是那种能够被识别、被理解、被体验、被观察、被讨论、被反省。那些存在于行动意识叙事和关呃行动意识叙事关系当中的世代现象。以及参与其中的行动者的世代经验，赋予了我们这一代 （our generation） 真实的存在。换句话说，世代现象和世代经验提供了世代作为一个领域研究的可能性和必要性。This this kind of obvious, but <笑> OK. So 从这个角度来看。这几篇文章有两个方向来做研究，一个是世代研来做世代研究，一个当然就是从社会政治的大环境的变化来探讨世代的形成和构成，比如嗯，担忧，担忧，担忧，担忧，呃呃，东吉，东吉，东吉 ，OK， <笑>比如东东吉所说的，我非常喜欢这一句话，他说，社会变动总是在经历变动的人当中留下无可磨灭的痕迹。This is how I translate your words into Chinese. Yeah, it's it's great. 所、so, 以，不管是中国的知青世代、独生子女时代，或者是台湾的八零后，都是在大环境变动下的产物。那嘉文的报告其实很好的说明了知青世代的研究如何大幅拓展文革研究的尺度和视野。那呃，毛毛毛金，对，毛的研究是从隔代教养注意到大环境的变化对跨世代互动的影响。呃，他。<笑> Sorry. 那从台湾社会的民主化过程也看到了新时代的出现与构成。那第二个取径呢，只是从行动者的说法和行动者的行动，也就是所谓的反身性的话语，来探讨时代现象对生活世界的构成。就好像 Justin 在那个导言里面所说的，时代作为一种 classificatory agent。Oh, I like the words. 至于世界构成的重要性，并不亚于性别、种族、族群或者是阶级。那这几位作者也都能够很好的在各自的研究当中呈现这个世代经验的动员，对于历史系记忆的塑造、社会运动的参与、族群意识、社会实践乃至于政治参与的具体塑造。那在这些研究成果的基础上。我从世代现象学，也就是所谓的现象学取径的角度提出，做三个延伸性的讨论。那也希望能够增加世代研究的主题和内容。<咳>第一个呢，就是关于世代标签。呃，我们刚刚已经讨论到分很多。那在一开始讨论的地方，就举了许多的例子来说明华语世界的世代标签非常的普遍。那也显示这些世代现象其实是非常的复杂。然而，我们也应该注意到这些各有千秋的世代标签，它所反映出来的区分意图，世代标签所涉及的价值与意志，以及世代标签的出现与使用的脉络。当然，这些在作者里、你们的文章里面都有讨论。不过，从这个角度来看，当我们注意到世代标签的出现和使用，对世代现象所产生的限定与触发。我们也就不难了解，某些世代现象似乎只会在某些特定的时刻或者情境底下变得非常的突出。那另外一方面呢，当人们 register 这个字我一直不知道怎么翻译成中文 ，register 到某种某一个世代标签的时间行动者，他的行动认同和世代经验也会受到那个标签的意义、意志和价值所左右，甚至会反映某种意识形态的立场。所以，基于上述两个理由，我们其实必须要更加关注世代标签的出现和使用，它的限定和触发
。那我怎么用它呢？在嘉文的文章里面，他对时代标签其实有一个很好的讨论，哈。那他的讨论也凸显时代标签的改变，它并不是任意的，看起来像是由下而上逐渐延上的一个春的怀旧浪潮，其实是国家与个人的共谋，而这个共谋显然是符合国家对世代主体的期待。不过，我也在想，这个“青春无悔”这个标签，它的使用方式和使用情境，应该会呈现某种限定趋势。我记得，也就是说。并不是所有人都会同意他。然后，事实上，在嘉文的文章里面也说到了这些“青春无”，其实有很多的争议，很多人并不赞同。那这个不赞同也就限定了这个标签的使用和流通。那这也意味着这个标签的出现，它不只是促使促成某种世代意识 ，it's not just promote the collective identity, but it also dif 呃、uh, differentiate the generation. 所以他也在分化这个时代。那记那在那个斯廷的文章里面，他所关注到的这个老年经验，对是知青时代经验的重塑。如果我们考虑到在官方出台的老关于老龄相关的文件，它是在一九八零年代就已经开始，所以我们可以想象得到，就是老龄人的世代意识是早在变成早在他们接受或者认为自己是孤独的。呃，早就在孤独的一代变老以前就已经出现了哈。那这些老龄人的世代标签，从老龄同志，所以我记得一开始是用老龄同志这样的一个标签，老龄同志到孤独的一代，那甚至到北京大妈、大妈这几个不同的世代转标签之间的转变，它除了是个世代主体身份认同的改变以外，在某种程度上，它是不是也会反映着社会变迁的趋势，或者根本就会有一个方向性？那这个会是什么？<咳>那在陶的文章里面呢，有两位主角，他们从知青到同志妈妈的时代，呃，同知也反映，当然也会反映出两位行动者所认同的标签本身的行动意涵。呃，那同样的在。呃，毛的文章里面讲到天津小区的隔代教养现象，那、呃、有关于天津小区的隔代教养现象的讨论。如果我们能够意识到这个世代标签对行动与思维所产生的那个限定效应，也许在访谈当中就会去特别去特别澄清不同世代的受访者对世代意的。受访者的意、世代意识、世代身份认同、世代身份识别，如何影响到他们对隔代教养的选择以及态度？那其实讲这么多，我想最重要的，我想要再次强调，就是我们对于这个世代标签的关注，事实上是能够反映世代现象本身的异质性 （heterogrosia） 的异质性。区分不同世代标签，它是如何动员世代经验，又如何影响行动意识与身份认同，其实可以带进更多的民族志细节的讨论，来复杂化整个关于世代现象的讨论。那第二个呢，是关于世代的在地性。我我用在地性这个词哈，因为我现在还不太确定用什么词比较好，我就又从一个简单的事情说起。我们都知道说，知青世代它指的一定是中国人的知青世代。天然毒一定是台湾人的知青时代，那啊，一定是台湾的年轻一代啊，<笑>不是台湾，对对对。所以换句话说呢，当我们在说我们这一代的时候，其实一定只有一个特定的限定范围里面的世代，比如说我们这一代的大学生，那我所指的可能是台湾这个地方的大学生，或者我们这一代的世界公民。那我现在讲的世界，就是一个世界范畴的范围的世界公民。那这也就是说，我们这一呃，这也就是说，我们这一代的什么，后面的这个什么是什么，包括他所指涉的对象，他所限定的范围等等，事实上提供了这个世代身份识别的最重要的脉络。那在这些讨论中。
最不受到重视的，大概就是这个限定范围它是怎么形是什么，然后它是怎么形成的，它是如何出。出现的几乎所有的讨论都是一笔带过。比如说，你在讲中国的孤独的一代，这里的中国人我们怎么定义他？这很奇怪的问题。不过我觉得这是重要的。为什么呢？因为到底包不包括少数民族在里面？那是不是这里的中国人也包括所谓的农村居民？也许你认为是，但很可能当你在用它的时候，农村居民其实是被 underrepresented。对，<咳>那。呃，所以换句话说，这里所出现的世代现，这里出现一个世代现象的尺度化问题。我们显然不能讲所谓的尺度化，我用这个词是 scale scaling 这个意思。所以我们当然不能理所当然的，呃，我们当然不能理所当然的假设，我们这一代 our generation 的我们都是同一个尺度。那么我们如何被尺度化，就有就会变得非常的重要。因为我们的尺度并不是理所当然的，比如说区分中国跟台湾，区分城市跟农村，区分汉人跟少数民族等等，在这些当中，这些区分在人们使用我们这一代的说法的时候，就早就在那里了。也就呃，有就也就是说，对于世代标签的脉络化呢，我们还是需要人注意到的是，人们所动用的尺度化化方案是什么。那在这里，我想要跟这个，嗯，我还是不太会念他的名字，那个人名字，东勇，东勇 ，OK， 东东吉，<笑>我想要跟东吉所提出的这个 configurational approach 的世代研究做一个对对话。我的理解是，正因为世代它不是 age per se， 也不是 event based， 所以它需要探讨世代是如何构成，然后把世代当做是一个 social configuration， 一种社会主态。来探讨世代主态的出现和构成，我非常同意这样的观点。不过，我也要强调，这里所选用的尺度化方案，它的 scale 到底是什么 ？scale scale。那对于这个社会主态的塑造，其实是有一个很重要的重要性。那你在这里非常成功的证明，民主化是塑造台湾年轻时代的。scale， 我我讲的尺度化方案。那事实上，我们过去在看那个 Bonny 的那个失落的一代的研究里面，我们看到的是他如很成功的证明，用革命这个尺度化的方案来塑造中国的知青时代。那也就是说，不同的尺度化方案，它事实上会产生不同的世代主态。那对尺度化化方案的重视，也就能够让我们更好的探讨这些世代主态的多样性。以及世代标签本身的多异性。那我之所以要强调这个尺度化方案的概念的重要性的是，是因为在它也跟我自己的研究有关。那我的研究是这个呃阿毛苗族教会里面的一个世代现象。那它其实也非常的复杂。有一群人叫做有一个世代是我们有一个特别的标签叫石门看老人。那这样的一个世代呢，就颇具代表性。那呃，我们其实如果只是单向的理解，我们可以知道说这个时代它的构成啊，跟石门坎和和它的石门坎背景有相当的关系，以及它在文革乃至改革开放以后的这个时代，在文革跟改革开放以后的遭遇有关。不过，如果我们没有考虑到石门坎这个标签，它的尺度的的它有多重的尺度，比如说中国的石门坎。基督教的石门槛，乃至于苗族的石门槛，它在不同的尺度底下的石门槛，它所呈现的样貌其实是互相冲突的。我在这里大概就不会这么说，我没有办法继续讲。就它所呈现的样貌是冲突的，那这也就导致石门槛老人这个时代，在这个阿莫社区里面的角色其实是非常尴尬的。对，那如果我们没有重视那个尺度化方案的不同。那事实上，我们就会 miss 掉那个非常尴尬的情况。第三个就是关于变迁节奏 ，OK， tempo of change。哦，我我非常喜欢这个词，我觉得它很酷。<笑>对， tempo of change。对，那世代现象之所以重要，乃是因为世代只能在变迁当中成为真实。世代事实上就作为。体现社会变迁的媒介，那也就必然涉及到人们对社会变迁的理解和感受。而变迁本身是有速度的
那这也意味着世代与社会边缘间的相互构成，它必然有一个速度的面向。那比较，嗯、呃，那个思婷在导论里面提到这个词，但好像没有进一步的讨论它。嗯，是吧？那可是，既然我们要讨论时代现象学的可能性呢，也就不能不谈到这个整个时代的构成，它是有一个时间跟空间的因素。因此，我还是要把这个概念抓出来，而且希望能够有更多的讨论。我对变迁节奏的理解是，人会因为觉得社会变化很快，追不上时代，然后你就会意识到自己老了，和年轻人是属于不同的时代。但有时候我们也会说，某个人不服老，他很很能够跟得上时代。所以，显然对变迁节奏的掌握影响到人对自我世代的认同，或者我们也会很直觉的，就是会认为老年人对社会变迁的节奏掌握的比较慢，年轻人可能掌握的比较快。那么，对变迁节奏的反应也，也也是能够成为某种共享的世代身份识别。比如说，我们也会说，我们年轻人就是未来。就刚刚有提到，就是所谓的跟得上时代这样。同样的，我们也可以想呢，就是这些呃，我我我马上想到的就是，在中国这些 register 在内卷标签的年轻人，跟 register 在躺平这两种不同时代标签的年轻人，很可能他们对于社会变迁的掌握的回应是非常不一样的。那。这几篇文章里面讨论到世代身份识别的构成时，事实上都没有将变迁节奏纳入考虑，就所有的 narrative 里面，我们完全没有看到这一个部分。<咳>那我自己的田野对象就是石门坎岛人，我刚刚提过的，让我印象最深刻的就是他们对社会变迁其实有非常多的看法，在他们这些老人的眼中呢，这些阿猫社会，他们的社会是。他的社会变迁是停滞的，是倒退的。相比于他过去的那个时代的快速变化，那也就是因为这样的停滞跟倒退，所以他是造成所谓的说阿猫社会的一个重大的危机什么。所以他们要花很多的力气去批评这些年轻人不读书或者做什么什么什么。对，呃，所以我认为就是也许。将来的讨论里面，应当有更多关于变迁节奏的讨论。对，那接下来我就用一点时间对个别的文章做一些做比较简短的评论。就我我很快的就，那嘉文的文章我觉得其实非常喜欢。那刚听到他说，呃，他是那个 b o n 的学生，嗯，非常能够理解。那我也我也觉得非常呃。恭喜他，事实上他的研究也的确在某种程度上能够超越波尼的论述，非常好，好对，三<笑>倍<笑>，不过是真的，对对。那那呃，我想要说的是，你特别注意到了一九九零年代所出现的这个独特的世代世代现象，那这个怀旧的浪潮，然后你也细细的爬梳这个现象所出现的政治和社会脉络，然后。也提出了说，跟我说，事实上，他可能是在八九六四的危机以后，共和国需要一个新的青春污秽的青新的青年论述，所以产生了这样的一个 discourse。那这样的一个 discourse， 它显然可以对过去的那种失落的一代的那样的一个时代现象做一个重新的评估，或者是一个 relabeling， 对吗？呃，那事实上。这篇文章让我非常，它它里边有一句话是：你认为这样的一个去政治化的怀旧运动，去政治化的怀旧运动，其实是国家与个人的共谋。我我我想我可以同意那样的论点，可是我很怀疑什么叫做去政治化，到底去政治化是什么意思？那读这篇，我看到这里的时候，我突然很快的就会想到说。毕莱德在谈《沉默的中国》里面提到的，就是在近代中国，呃，对近代中国史的沉默是中国政府维持统治合法性的重要手段。但是当时我在读他的书的时候，虽然觉得很有意思，可是我一直没有办法理解他所说的去政治化跟沉默到底是什么关系，到底是什么意思
，因为中国政府的论述控制应该不只是近代史，而且他可是为什么要强调近代史？然后呢，为什么？呃，就我所理解的，对言论主体的控制最大的伤害，应该是就是日常琐碎事物经验的整个泛政治化。其实我不太能够理解逼来的当时所提出来的去政治，呃，近代史的去政治化是什么意思？那嘉文的文章实际上某种程度上解决解决我的困惑。呃，我大概可以这样理解：对世代经验的去政治化，显然让世代经验的反身性语境失去对政治现实的批判，就好像确实是一种针对近代史的沉默手段。但我还是很困惑的一点是，怀旧本身就充满了政治潜力。Nostalgia is politics。嗯，所以青春无悔的怀旧运动为什么会是对世代经验的去政治化？那为什么不是一个政治化？那去政治化，你这个去政治化的解释是不是受到毕来登的影响？对，那或许你可以解释一下为什么你说的去政治化到底是什么意思？对。<咳>那陶的文章呢？呃，我觉得你刚刚的报告要比文章写的清楚多了。<笑>对，就是我比较能够掌握到那个文章所想要强调的那个，呃 ，biographic approach 的那个重要性。对，好，那所以，我有一点修改了我的对对你的文章的一个评论。那我想最重要的一个就是这个 mothering 的行动想象，在同志运动里面显然是似乎非常的的受到欢迎，而且你刚刚的报告里面也有提到说为什么会会会这样。对<咳>，那我不太理解的一点是，从知青的母亲，从知青到同志母亲，除了是 biographic connection 以外，还有没有其他的连接？我还是没有抓到了一个重点，就是到底为什么知青经验这些母亲，他们同样都 engage 他们的 generational 呃 identity， engage 他们的世代世代身份认同，可是知青经验为什么对他们成为同志母亲或者这个有什么重要性？为为什么会那么重要？我可以不是知青，我可以没有知青的经验，但我还是可以 engage 那个 mothering 的的的行动，我还可以是，我还是可以成为同志母亲。那我们看到了他的那个变化，但是没有看到具体的连接。对，就是到底世代经验跟他们的身份认同有什么？就到底知青的经验跟他们身份认同是有什么关系？呃，那假如说我们说。同志母亲可以是一种政治能动性的形形式。那么，思婷的文章里边的那个大妈，大概就是把世代政治的可能性发挥的更加的淋漓尽致。呃，我简单的说，呃、就是我就不复述我刚刚讲的这个，我我的 summary， 我我有两个困惑哈。第一个其实是比较臆测性的，我主要是想听听看思婷的看法，因为从这篇的文章来看的话，老龄老龄世代的政治动员在网络上是不是被允许的？对他们不仅可以争取老人福利，甚至还可以争贬时缺啊，然后还可以 promote 一些他们的，还有什么维权运动啊。那你怎么理解这些显然相对较高的政治动员能量和政治动员的尺度，就是很大的规模的一个动员？到底这些当前号称最孤独一代的老龄世代，他们的特殊的世代经验，是使他们有比较高的政治能量吗？或者只是因为这样的政治动员符合国家利益，所以被鼓励？所以，其实就是所谓的刚刚嘉文所说的那个共谋的关系。我之所以这样问，是因为其实我们发现，就是这这是好像是一个很普遍的现象，不止在北京大妈是这样子。然后我记得那个中国导演纪录片，中国纪录片导演
黄文海，他有一个纪录片，拍摄的对象是一群退休的老干部，然后他那个片名原本就是在一次的座谈会，片名叫《我们》，那个片名就叫《我们》，就讲。那我记得他在有一次的映后座谈会会里面就讲到说，或者是在一个私下聊天的时候，他讲说这个这个片名他原来是叫。政治动物，那后来因为觉得这个好像有点太贬义了，所以他在参展的时候才把它改成我们。那也就是说，其实他也根据他自己的长期观察，就是这一个世代的人，他们似乎有特别强大的政治参与动力，而且有很容易很特别强那个政治参与的能量，其实特别的高。那我自己的十分感言就当然也有同样的倾向，所以，我其实是想问问你的看法。那这种很高能量的政治动员，他跟他们的执行的经验，跟他有关系吗？就我没有办法回答，但我我很想知道，对，你会怎么看这个问题？我的第二个困惑其实是，世代意识也可以是一种群，呃，就等于群体意识嘛，它就是一种群体意识吗？就是还是说这两个这两个是有差别的？那你自己也提到说，在这个网络平台出现，其实是你的田野的一个转捩点，因为大妈有话说，连接老龄老龄群体的方式是前所未见的，老龄世代身世代意识、世代身份识别、世代身份认就变得十分的具体。围绕着老龄，就出现了一种新的群体意识，从平台的互动，呃，就有一种新的群体意识从平台的沟通互动当中出现。我我特别强调新的群体意识，因为这是你自己用的词，我,我以为你会用新的 generation a l i d e n t i t y or consciousness， 但你用的是群体意识，所以我特别提出来。那我其实好像你也一直没有。说明到底这个新的群体意识有什么独到之处？那我们其实刚刚也已经提到，我们其实有理由相信说，老龄同志的世代意识在大妈有话说之前就已经形成。那我也可以同意，大妈有话说，他是他可以动员不同的世代经验，然后重塑老龄同志的世代意识。但我还是不太确定，世代我不太确定我能够同意世代意识只是一种群体意识吗？那如果不是的话，你要怎么去区分它？那补充一下，就是关于所谓的新型群体意识，这种通过这种网络互动所产生的一种新型的群体意识。王明科老师最近的那个那本书《毒药猫的理论》里边有一个我觉得非常有趣的说法，叫做“网络存在”。细节我就不多说了，但的意思我觉得是一个蛮，你可也许可以讨论，可以看一下他怎么谈这个。只有通过网络平台运作所形成的这个群体意识，新型的群体群体意识，一群体意识，它把它叫做网络存在。对 ，OK 那。那呃，林毛的文章呢？林汉毛的文章，他们所谈的是隔代教养 （grandparenting）。我用中文讲隔代讲隔代教养，那其实就蛮能够凸显他们。两个的切入点其实是还蛮让人耳目一新的，耳目一新的。为什么呢？因为当我们讲到隔代教养的时候，我们马上想到的就是农民工的情况情境，就是在中文的语境底下，你很快就会想到这是农民工的情境。那农民工不得不怎样？所以隔代教养非常的普遍，所以隔代教养往往被视为是一种社会问题。那。两位的文章呢，其实是告诉我们，如果我们不把隔代教养视为劳动力的派生现，劳动劳动力流动的派生派生现象，从世代的观点来看，那劳动基劳动呃隔代教养其实是非常普遍的，它在农村也是这样，可在城市也是这样，而且人们似乎是把它当成是非常理所当然。呃、我我觉得。但我对这篇文章，我其实是有一点意见。对，为为什么？因为，因为，嗯，我很讶异，我有我有两点讶异啊。第一个就是，你在作者两位作者在讨论隔代教养的责任和义务的协商
，但是竟然好像没有考虑到子女和对父母的赡养责任与义务。在中在在中国的环境底下，这两个我想是很难区分开来的。那我很难想象说，后者对前者是没有影响。也是基于同样的理由，我会把我会对于两位作者把隔代教养当做是工作，就是你们的 title 文章的 title a new job， 就是来分析他们如何分配责任与义务，感到有一点不安。对，好。另外呢，我有一点压抑，独生子女对。父母就是在文章里面说访所有的所有的访谈对象里面，独生子女对父母分担教养责任的预期会有那么普遍？呃，我有点怀疑他会不会是取样的偏见？对，就是因为你说说访，因为毕竟当然在台湾的经验跟在中国的经验不会一样，不过对我有点怀疑哈。那你们的访谈对呃作者的访谈对象都是有隔代教养的家庭，那基本上没有呈现任何没有隔代教养教呃没有隔代教养的家庭的访谈记录，那他们是不是也有同样的预期？那事实上我们也知道有一些受访者他们表示担心隔代教养会产生的一些问题。那这样的担心是不是也可能成为人们拒绝隔代教养的理由？对，我想这些都是必须要被考虑的。对，呃，同样的就是，呃，不过就这个其实就没有太重要。到最后，我们好像终于来到那个东底的文章了。<笑><笑><笑>我想延续刚刚最早的关于那个尺度化的讨论。那从比较研究的角度来看，显然民主化所带动的一连串的社会变迁，是塑造台湾一九八零后八零后世代的最重最重要的那个社会动力。那呃，我自己非常的喜欢这篇文章，因为它确实是把台湾青年世代主态的讨论。呃，有一个非常完整的讨论，然后也很能够很好的把不同的世代标签，就是跟八零后那个世代的各种不同的世代标签整合到一个比较大的社会进程当中。那我我有一个怀疑啦，如果我们用去中国化所带动的一些一连串的社会变迁，那其实也可以得到另外一种。世代主态，那他可能就会，可能是不是会一样是八零后？可能不是，或者不过可能会有一个 overlap。对，所以大概，嗯，对啊，我就是有一点想象。<笑>同样的，就是不过，因为我们今天好像。台湾研究已经有一点 under 的资源解决了，所以我本来<笑>我本来是想要问一下<笑> Dongi， 如果你来看中国的八零后，那你会认为哪样什么样的一个一个一个 social force 对是最重要的？对，不过这个问题可能不是很重要的，不太适合现在问。对，那好，最后呢，我想。世代现象和世代经验已经越来越不可忽略。带着世代的进世代视角进入中国研究或者台湾研究，可能已经不是一个研究选项，而且甚至必须已经有某种必须必要性跟迫切性，迫使这些研究者不得不开始不得不一定要关注世代现象。那事实上，当然世代研究或者以特定世代作为。对象的研究也一定也一直都有，比如最近江以林有出版的一本书叫《Study Dot》，对 ，How the Generation Chinese Elites Prepare for Global Competitions， 我觉得还有十二个关于学生的故事，还蛮有趣的。那不过，世代研究如何能够跳定跳脱这种特定对象、特定年人群的？代表性研究，而成为一个能够阐释世代真实性与世代经验的现象学研究，也是这个 special issue 所强调的，所要达到的一个目的。
。那这个世代现象如何能够不被化约成为文化现象或者其他现象？如何能够更加凸显世代对世界构成的重要性？这个的确是一个亟待开发的取径。那目前看起来 ，our generation 或者时代现象学的研究和其他时代取径的对话，时代研究取径的对话好像比较少，就是整体来说。那嗯，我们也希望将来有更多的讨论。那我也希望我自己的也也有一个文章可以跟大家对话。好，我就到讲解到这，我就讲到这里。对。那我们是不是请大请大家呃？对，就是虽然可能我们对不好意思，没关系，差不多就是我们大家对呃，我们可能先一个一个就是说，可能有有一些反应，就是关于黄老师，我不知道我们是不是要从嘉文再再次开始。啊，那我也可以讲中文嘛，比较这样比较快。<笑>呃，谢谢谢谢黄老师的的评论。呃，我会转达给那个我的导师，<笑>我会告我会告诉我的导师，就是那个黄淑丽老师说我的研究比他的好。没<笑>有、哎，就是然后关于这个去政治化的问题，我觉得我现在。我没有办法很好的回答这个问题，因为这个对我来说是一个刚刚提出的新问题。我就想说一下我我的我的一些刚才想到的一些看法吧。其实“去政治化”这个词不是我的词，我必须要说这个词是 Justine 帮我想的，就是<笑>对吧？我在文章当中其实我写了很长一段想要描述这个意思，然后因为这个文章有字数限制嘛，所以 Justine 跟我说，就是你是不是想说这个“去政治化”这个词？我说啊，这个词是。就会觉得描述的很精准，所以我觉得至少证明，在我跟 Rusin 之间，我们是有一个共识的。我们觉得“去政治化”这个词是可以表达这个意思的。但其实我们两个没有讨论“去政治化”到底意味着什么。然后黄老师刚才提出这个问题的时候，我突然就意识到，我可能没有，从来没有很认真的去想过这个政治到底是什么，或者说，当我在用。去政治化的时候，我没有考虑过政治到底是个什么东西，就是去政治化，所以它，所以去政治化这个概念就有就很暧昧。去政治化这个概念概念之所以暧昧，是因为政治这个概念就很暧昧。所以政治到底是什么呢？因为很我不是不是研究政治的嘛，所以就是很多政治学家他有提出自己的观点。然后，比如说，如果按照这个，就德国的政治学家卡尔施密特，他指出了政治具有不可化约性。然后，如果按照卡尔施密特的概念的话，那去政治化就可以被理解为是一种用道德的、审美的或者经济问题来取代对于政治问题的这样一个讨论。然后，其实在，在在这个角度上来说的话，其实政治这个问题。就就有点像那个克罗奇说的，一切历史都是都是当代史，然后那一一切问题其实也都是可以是政治的。但如果是这么去考虑这个问题的话，会不会又又出现了一种泛政治化的这样一个概念？我就拿这个青春无悔这个事情来举例子吧。我其实说，呃，如果说它是去政治化的话，还有另外一个角度可以去去去延伸，就是因为青春无悔这个这个词。不光光是知青一代的问题，实际上，在一九九零年代，“青春无悔”这个词在在中国、在大陆非常的流行。就比如说，我我不知道台湾这边有没有听说过，嗯，就是高晓松，他是一个非常著名的校园歌手，然后校园呃音乐人吧。然后他曾经写过一首歌，就叫《青春无悔》，一九九一年的时候写的。一九九一年的时候，中国大陆还有一个电影叫《青春无悔》，然后是是一个姓周的导演拍的。这两个是。完全跟知青没有关系，但只是青春无悔已经成为一个就全社会都在用的这样一个词。我觉得这样的话，可不可以？这与其说是一种去政治化，不如说是一种娱乐化吧，或者是说，不是？所以说，在这个角度来理解的话，我觉得日新的跟我我们理解的这种去政治化，其实上是一种消解紧张的这样一个概念，就是去掉了原来那种政治上的那种冲突性，把它变得更更缓和、更平滑。可能是不是这样，就是去去理解这个去政治化的概念，但是这个这个答案并不完美啊，因为我并没有仔细的考虑过政治到底是一个什么概念，所以我就暂时回答到这儿。OK， 
接下来是不是就是涛来说说两句？嗯，呃，好的。呃，首先就非常感谢呃黄淑丽老师，呃非常有启发性的这个评论，呃，事实上我想就是简单的回答一下两点，呃，所以关于这个呃 mothering 他的行动想象，他就像我文章里面说，他实际上是一个相当普遍的，呃，所以我们会看到就在美国、在台湾、在呃。就是世界各地事实上都有类似的组织的存在，但是我想强调的一点，在这文章中是，呃，今天我们有一个这样的组织，它以前叫同性恋亲友会了，现在有改名，因为呃压力的原因。但是呃，就是他我一开始展现的图片中，我们看到其他的母亲，呃，还有父亲，事实上但比较少，呃，他们事实上都呃，在呃，他们事实上就是。不是很多人就没有执行经历，因为他们年纪可能更小一点，他们可能更接近就是于静讲那个范围，甚至还要呃更年轻一点，因为有一些可能还没有退休。呃，但是我想强调一点，这两位呃就是呃主角在文章里面的，他们事实上是开拓了这一个行动方式的人，然后他们开拓这个行动方式，呃，就跟他们的执行经历非常有关系。为什么呢？因为我们之前讲到，就是说这个呃批评的可能性，反身反身性话语它的一个缺失，呃，然后呃，文章很强调的一点就是说，他们是在呃。这个在呃网络上面写布洛格的这个过程之中，呃，去呃，在一个集体话语这种呃批评性话语集体呈现的状态下，重新去思考他们的经验，然后这个世代经验事实上是成为了一个契机，让他们可以重新去。事实上，这就是呃，在我看来是一个政治化的过程。然后，因为这反身性话语批评的缺失，事实上就是说，呃。大概就是可能也不能说完全是一个去政治化，因为呃，像你所说，呃，他这种这种呃，对以前呃呃经验的一种嗯、呃、嗯回忆本身就是很有政治能量，但是我们会看到，就比如说青春话语，他这个呃呃青春话语这个出现，他在某种程度上事实上是有去呃。把这种能量在某种程度上是给压制下来。然后我文章之中，特别是第二位老偶偶姨，她很明显的就是提到说，她去参加知心聚会的时候，然后大家都是各种无悔，然后她就对这个一开始就感到非常的不满。后来，呃，她这个不满是。这种批评性话语不只是关于这个知心经历，但是也是关于整个社会其他的各种问题，在呃其他博友的这种讨论下，让他重新去思考这这这一段经历，所以他就成为了嗯呃，我可以说是呃呃，就是变成了有一种呃，这个、反思事实上是让他们可以突破这种呃没有组织平台呃非常呃。原子化的这种就是，呃，话语状态下可以去参与的一个一个契机。然后他们这个参与，这就是我想说的第二点，事实上是很关乎他们自己的情感经历、个体的这种情感经历。这我可以就是稍微 paraphrase 刚刚刚呃您提到的一个词叫尺度化方案。我觉得这个个人情感事实上是他们的一个政治化方案，因为他们在呃呃。他们的博文中很多提到的是一个个人的经验，那在他们看来，事实上这种对呃个人，而、呃、不是对这种非常嗯国家政治的讨论，它事实上是呃让他们可以去重新呃展现自己的批评话语，然后所以呃里面提到的，特别是呃呃偶仪偶仪，他会说我不关心政治，政治。是一个很糟糕的事情，我觉得他非常的肮脏。但是我可以讲我自己的经验，我们的经验就是说，我们那一代没有权利谈爱情，个人情感被否定了，被抹杀了。然后在这种情况下，然后再看到这些年轻人，他们勇敢的去爱，然后我感到很触动。然后就就我觉得这有两个层面了，所以就是回到了，我觉得最最重要的就我觉得是一个批评平台。有没有
就是在社会的普及程度的问题，我们有没有权利批评？我们我们有权利批评什么？我们怎么去批评？然后这个批评的，所以就是在某种程度上，我也觉得这就解释了，呃，很多年轻人也是现在关于女性的问题，关于性别的问题，关于这个呃，就是所谓呃性少数的问题，它变成了一个政治动员的一个。就是很重要的节点，这样子为什么会这样子？因呃，因为很多为什么工人话题，它反而在某种程度上，事实上，当然这跟就是大家的阶级的那种 positioning 是有关系的。但是，但就在某种程度上，我想讲的就是这个，就是说这个情感成为一个政治呃化的的呃可能性的这样的的的呃，就是就是呃呃契机。对，基本上就是这样子。谢谢。呃，拜托你。哦，对对对对对对。没关系，没关系。好，好，谢谢。呃、uh, ，So thank you for all these、uh, comments, uh, Shuli, and、um, well, I I won't develop. Uh, too much as well. Maybe I, I'll concentrate on your question of the fact that 就是他们被允许。Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, they've been allowed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would just like to say that,、uh, of course, like they managed to, like basically, it was created by a company, and company they know how to navigate what's allowed and what's not allowed to say. And I think we can see in Beijing Dama's evolution, uh, 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 as I say, a clear moment. Uh, a clear evolution in the ways that、uh, topics are addressed. As,、um, for example,、uh, in the beginning you have Sundama,、uh, which is、uh, one of the original Dama, <laughs> but which、uh, left after one、uh, about one year. And I think she kind of left also because she didn't find the space where she could express what she wanted because she focused a lot on、uh, inequalities of pensions, especially for Tie Tre Xiu Zhen Yuan. And、uh, and so there, there's a lot of very I would say very political stuff about challenging issues of justice、uh, for their generation, etc., which appear a lot in her original discourse. But she's been really once、uh, like kind of sided afterwards. And when I talked、uh, about these issues with like the show promoter,、mm -hmm. uh, he kind of said he was a bit embarrassed. He was like, "Yeah, no, we don't really talk about that. It's not." It's not a complicated issue. We just don't talk about it, and so I mean, the the kind of I think the young people who created the show realized as they were doing it that maybe you know inviting Dama would not just be talking about you know uh, uh, grandchildren and uh, and uh, how you know their youth or whatever.、Mm. <laughs> What happened? But、uh, but uh, but but you know they kind of realize that actually like Tama and、uh, and that this what they had to say was actually a bit more less comfortable than they hope so, and 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 you can see like for example in the like some tactics that they use sometimes to allow these people to talk about what they want but kind of avoid. Uh, being targeted as well, like you see in the subtitles. At first, I thought it was just a typo, but then I realized that in all the videos, whenever they talk about Tui Xiu Jin, Tui Xiu Zhe Du, they don't write the words; they just write Pinyin. And I think that's、uh, I, I think it's kind of a, a strategy for them so that you know the subtitles in the video would not lead、uh, censors or whatever to this kind of topics who are actually kind of sensible.、Mm -hmm. And so I think you know you can find this kind of stuff,、uh, which you know yeah. So basically, it's allowed, but they still try to navigate uh, 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 with a lot of stuff. Oh, there's a question. Is why this? 为什么这个时代好像特别容易被政治动员？刚刚陶其实大概有谈谈到一点点。Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I I think I mean the whole all the people who were socialized in the fifties and sixties were extremely politicized, like and socialized to political participation, and not just the judging. Because you ask me what is the the judging or some relationship, and people in Beijing Dama or Huashuo are not all judging. Some of them are, but not all of them. And so that's kind of what I wanted to say was that you know 
um, most people focus on you know the influence of the jutting experience but actually in this show you can see that people can identify collectively even though you know just because they grew up in the same period and were uh, kind of affected in their whole life course uh, by the same public policies even though not in always the same way but they kind of feel ways of uh, identifying collectively this despite not having this uh, sort of stuff. And so, yes, the, to re answer your question, I mean, the, the general politicization of this uh, generation really plays a role as well. Sorry. Oh, I'm not other questions. The generational consciousness, the same as a group mm. consciousness. Yeah, uh, yeah well, as you, as, as you said, like, that's what I say in the article. For me, like, mm -hmm. group uh, consciousness is a, a general term like you can be conscious of belonging to a group in very various perspectives from very various approach and generational consciousness is one aspect of group identity but people who would be from a i don't know one specific minzu you could have like this i you know uh, uh, race or ethnicity consciousness that would actually come on top of the other. So people are not just one consciousness in terms of identity or in terms of race or gender, you know, like everything kind of uh, accumulates uh, in everyone's experiences and people can relay more, uh, can relate more or less to different types of identities according to their needs, according to what they want to prove, according to what they, 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 they want to say at certain moments. So I think that's, yeah. It's, Maybe Ting Yu, if you want to. Ah, uh, 好，就我又切换成中文吧，就是非常非常感谢黄老师的点评。然后我只能基于我对林青的项目的有限的理解来去回答这些问题。就是我觉得这个点很好，就是我们确实没有写到没有选择隔代教养的家庭，然后他们会有什么样的问题？他们为什么拒绝隔代教养？他们有什么样的担心？我觉得这这个是。对，如果可以有这样的数据会非常好，会把整个整个 picture 都更加丰富一点。然后，而且，但是我们确实有提到一个人，他他的担心是说，他觉得他的岳母就是说方言，然后可能教育程度也不是很高，然后他很担心就是有这样的问题。但是因为，呃，就是这联系到另外一个问题，就是说。他们独生子女对父母赡养的期待真的有这么高吗？就是他们真的这么多人，就是有这个隔代教养吗？那就那就联系到就是说，呃，他们有其他的选择吗？就是 what kinds of alternative they have？ 所以我觉得，嗯，就是可能就还是跟整个大的社会福利的提供以及就是公共养育的这些。呃，机构的缺失是有关系的，所以就算他们有这样那样的担心，但是最终他们还是觉得可能这是最现实的一个安排。然后，呃，对于就是子女对于父母的赡养义务没有提，确实这两个是非常难以区分的，区分的。呃，但是有一些，我觉得我们也挺强调说，父母在考虑隔代教养的时候，都有在想到。这跟他们以后的晚年的子女对他们的赡养有什么关系？就很多他们都会直接提到说，我们现在是这样，是为了考虑到以后的一些子女对我们的赡养啊什么的。我觉得如果可以，就是更包括。年轻的呃年轻人，他们自己对于父母赡养的态度，包括进来，包括他们的话语，确实会就是更是呃提高这篇文章。然后以及对为什么我们把隔代教养当做工作，然后放在标题上，其实我反思一下，可能是我们想突出说，这对于很多呃老年人其实是一个负担，就是因为有有一些话语会觉得说啊，这样他们可以 enjoy 安享晚年呐、啊，就是但其实不是，他们很多人就甚。是有一个人，他真的去找了一个工作，就是为了逃避隔代抚养。所以，呃，可能这是我，但是可能这我们也没有更好的探讨这个跟工作有什么关系，在文章里面有没有很多联系。所以这个标题确实可能，嗯、呃，不是特别的恰当。对，谢谢老师的评价。Okay, uh, th thank you, s u d i for your your comments. Uh, so I will be very quick, and I think I, I will follow up on what、uh, Justin just said about uh, um, generational uh, 
identity, oh, sorry, being um, only one of uh, the different dimensions or intersecting uh, dimensions of uh, a person's or, or a group uh, identity. I think it's very important and it's, um, it's in the concept of generational units, in fact. So for my paper and uh, today, I insisted uh, mainly on what unites a generation, but of course, like every group, a generation is also divided on certain uh, aspects, on certain subjects. And uh, so it's, it's interesting because um, generational identity, like, uh, like all the, the, the identity, the collective identities, is um, both made of uh, uh, a general narrative that, to certain points, has to stay in uh, the state of ambiguity and inaccuracy, to be inclusive. Because if you are not too precise on what you say about uh, the we, then you exclude people. So it both has to be uh, inclusive, so general, and uh, in a certain state of ambiguity. It's the same thing with the national identity. Mm -hmm. If you start to look very precisely at, at what is a French or what is a Taiwan, it is very dangerous because uh, it starts to be exclusive. I think it's the same thing with... Uh, it is the same thing with a generational identity. Um, and of course, it is also divided into generational units. That is uh, a group of people that will oppose uh, uh, to other peoples um, on uh, certain subjects, such as the Chu Zhong Wu Hua theme, which is, uh, uh, of course, a subject of uh, division. Most of the young Taiwanese, in fact, oppose the Chu Zhong Wu Hua cultural policy, which is uh, mm -hmm. interesting. They identify with the Taiwanese nation, but they are against uh, the desinicization of, of Taiwan. Um, and uh, and they, they, they are the first to defend the traditional uh, Chinese characters. It is very, very interesting, very interesting. Uh, another uh, example was during uh, the Sunflower Movement and the Anti-Nuclear Movement, the debates on the use of violence uh, as a mean of protest. The, the, there was a clear divide, and uh, so we can talk about generation units in terms of means to protest. Uh, the use of uh, violence, the use of strike, which is not in the common uh, culture of uh, protest in Taiwan. Uh, if we compare with France or, or the United States, for example, where, where we have a much more violent uh, uh, civil society. Um, the other uh, theme would be uh, nuclear energy and, nu and uh, energy transition. So, of course, we have uh, this we, uh, this generational we is both made of uh, um, a collective imaginary that has to stay uh, uh, quite ambiguous, on not, pre not precise, and of uh, different uh, generational uh, units. And I will mm -hmm. stop here because uh, I've been too long mm -hmm. before. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, if I can just like, add a little something, uh, because you were saying about this, this issues of e exclusion uh, within a uh, huh? generation. And actually, like for the Beijing Tama, it's interesting because mm -hmm. maybe they don't talk about the like Mutsun So they exclude a part of it. But actually, when they talk about their experience, like for example, you have a YouTube channel also for Beijing Tama. And if you look at the comments, you have old people, retired people from uh, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Huaren from all over the world who actually managed to identify with Beijing Dama, even though they are not like Chinese Dama, you know, but because of what they say about their uh, grandparenting issues, about how difficult it is to, you know, be a, a, an autonomous uh, elderly in the contemporary world, they, they still manage to identify. So, you know, sometimes the borders of who the we is uh, can be very surprising. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Yes, of course. Interesting. <laughs> so maybe we can we, we, yeah. we can stop here. Yeah. We've been too long. Sorry for oh. the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you again, everyone online, uh, for uh, for coming and uh, exchanging. And we hope to. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you could hear me well. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you also, uh, Pierre and Marie, who I see in the Hong Kong office. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.